Senator DeMario. Here. Senator Archambault. Here. Present. Senator Coyne. Here. Senator Coleman. Here. Senator Miller. Senator Miller. Senator Rogers. Senator Rogers. Uh, Senator Valverde. Here. Senator Roy, we have seven present. There's a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And I want to welcome everyone to the committee, including our guests. Uh, we have a, a number of presentations uh, for us this evening in committee. So we do not have any bills for hearing, but we will have a set of presentations. Um, and as the agenda mentions, we're um, hearing tonight both the information update overview on the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is also referred to as REGI. Um, and we're also hearing from a, a related uh, concurrent topic, which is the Rhode Island Energy Efficiency Program. We'll be getting an overview and update. Um, the, you know, really the, my intention in having these two um, programs be discussed is um, for as far as Reggie, Rhode Island has been um, part of this uh, initiative since 2007 and I thought that this would be a good opportunity for us to get an update about um, and give some just some grounding for the committee to make sure that we understand and, and um, hear how the program is is working um, in the state similarly the energy efficiency programs um, Rhode Island is a leader in energy efficiency in in the in the region and in the country and so I thought it was a good opportunity to hear both from um, National Grid and RISE Engineering specifically to, to that program. But I, um, and just so the committee members know, as well as the presenters, we do have one person signed up for public comment. So my intention really was to let the presenters go ahead uh, with their presentations and to take uh, questions from the committee members if there are, if there are, um, you know, natural stopping points as the as our guests are presenting that you want to uh, check with me and I will check with the committee to see if there are any questions and then uh, we will move on through the presentations that way. So then that way uh, committee members can try to raise their questions as, as close to real time as possible. I know that in having presentations and a question and answer in a format like this is challenging. So um, if, if the presenters can just do me that favor, if you can find natural stopping points, uh, defer to me. I will check with the committee members to have any questions and then we'll answer uh, to have any Q&A through the chair. And then after the presentations are completed, then we will then move to public comment and we will hear from our our, our public t uh, testifier on, on these topics. So uh, with that being said, the first uh, presenter we have uh, in front of us today is Janet Coit, the director of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. Um, and, and Janet, and, and for all the other presenters, I think if you can keep the presentation of your, the, the portion of your uh, time, that's a presentation to about 15 minutes. But again, we will be allowing for questioning throughout. So uh, Janet, welcome to the committee, director, and you can go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Oyer. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent. So as you uh, suggested, any time that you, uh, Chair Oyer, want to interject or I'll try to, I will try to um, pause and I think it is helpful to have a give and take or questions um, when the certain slide is up. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And did I do that successfully? coming through on this end. Okay, great. Okay. So good evening. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm Janet Coit, the director of Rhode Island DEM. Um, and I've been in my seat for over 10 years. And I have been um, working on the regional greenhouse gas initiative throughout that time. Uh, as mentioned by the chair, the regional greenhouse gas initiative authorizing legislation in Rhode Island was enacted in 2007. 
uh, uh, and DEM has promulgated the regulations uh, that allow the state to implement that program. I know there's a few, uh, uh, many of you know this, um, but there's a few new senators on the committee, and I just wanted to very quickly talk about the mission of DEM. It's very broad. Uh, we handle environmental protection statutes, clean air, clean water, land remediation. We handle natural resources management, conservation of habitat, states, parks, beaches, campgrounds, fishing ports, agriculture, uh, marine safety. So it's a very broad mission and an important mission that touches all Rhode Islanders every day. We have a strategic plan that's designed to outline the top strategic goals and have uh, clear direction provided for our programs. So Reggie, as the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is called affectionately, is critical to achieving two of our strategic goals. So the first being taking action to counter climate change and its effects locally and regionally. And under each goal, we have uh, objectives and actions and reducing greenhouse gas emissions from human activities using strong local and regional partnerships is one of the uh, actions under the climate change goal. Another goal that's critical to Reggie is protecting and restoring our environment to create greener, healthier communities and specifically promoting clean air locally and regionally by supporting strong public policies and regional efforts. I will add that with the Act on Climate having been enacted by the General Assembly and signed into law, that further strengthens both our charge in regard to the mandatory goals that are set for the state to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and our tools to achieve them. Um, Reggie has been a really successful tool. So let me start with the program design of Reggie. It was a first cap and trade program of its kind. Uh, so that was very exciting. Way back then, uh, people thought that a federal program was about to be enacted and we wanted to get ahead of the game. Well, we did get ahead of the game, um, but the federal program never followed. But in the meantime, um, we've had great success at a regional level. It's a cap and invest program. So what does that mean? Uh, Reggie creates a cap on emissions, a declining cap on emissions from uh, the electric sector and then uh, there's an auction where the polluters, the power plants, have to purchase carbon allowances, which is a, essentially the right to pollute, the right to emit a ton of carbon. These are sold at auction. The participating states in Reggie receive an allocation of the proceeds, and then those are invested into things that meet the program goals. So I wanna be clear that the Rhode Island general law that was enacted provided the authority for Rhode Island to participate in Reggie, but also directed that the proceeds from the sale of allowances go back into strategies like energy efficiency, renewable energy, that make sure that in addition to the declining cap, that we keep making headway locally. Um, so it's kind of, a, um, it further augments the goals of Reggie by reinvesting the proceeds into reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the electric sector. Um, the, uh, in Rhode Island, we have five power plants that are part of Reggie. And I will, um, I think, hold on, you guys. I, I skipped a slide. Um, I, um, I wanted to show you that the program, it started out uh, with 11 states New Jersey left and then they came back. Um, Virginia has joined the program. Um, Pennsylvania is working to join the program. North Carolina is considering joining the program. Um, there are, and, and it's because it's been successful. So since Reggie was created, over 50% reduction in the emissions from power plants uh, in that base since the, since the program creation um, compared to the base year. So that's been wildly successful. Since it was enacted, the percentage of greenhouse gas emissions from the electric sector has gone down as a share of the overall economy-wide emissions, whereas, for instance, the transportation emissions have gone way up. Um, the Reggie participating states, just to put it in perspective, they are equal to 
uh, the fourth largest economy in the world. So the 11 Reggie states have a GDP of 4.4 trillion. So it's a regional program, but it packs a lot of weight. Um, and also when it comes to the electric sector, a regional program aligns well with the regional nature of the electric grid. Um, all right, I got, I got ahead of myself. So program design, um, I'm on the Reggie board. Uh, there is a, a, each state enacts Reggie at a state level and decides how the, uh, um, how the revenues from the program will be invested. Um, since it's a market mechanism, um, it provides a financial incentive to the electric presiders, pr providers to dispatch cleaner, lower emission sources of energy. Um, it provides a market signal to them that they should keep investing. And as mentioned, because the cap declines over the years, we know that we are, the cap declines um, relative to the right size of Reggie. When more states are added, the cap is increased to allow for their emissions, but overall it's declining. Um, Reggie has a 25 megawatt threshold. So we have five power plants in Rhode Island um, that are part of Reggie. Um, and the auction has, this has been terrifically successful. There have been 51 auctions so far. Uh, the price has been, set, uh, the last auction was $7.50 for a ton of carbon. Um, and the cumulative proceeds for all the auctions to the Reggie States have been $4 billion over time with Rhode Island, let me see if that's the next slide, receiving $88 million in auction proceeds over the life of Reggie. Um, the, um, the health benefits, part of our clean air imperative is to improve air quality. So Reggie's contributed greatly to health benefits in the region. Um, and as mentioned, the Reggie footprint is expanding as other states look to be part of the successful program. I wanna anticipate a question, which is what is the cost to the consumer for Reggie? And independent audits, um, reviews by the program, it's really a negligible, there are a lot of things that go into the cost of electricity and the cost of the um, acquisition of allowances at a wholesale level has not significantly impacted electric rates. Um, this next slide just shows the blue line is the CO2 emissions that they have decreased by 50% since the beginning of REGI while our economy has grown. So the emissions limit means the cap goes down and the emissions get lower over time, which means less and less pollution is, is allowed from, these, um, from the electric generating units. And that has happened simultaneously to the growth of the economy in this area. Um, in fact, it may not seem that way, but the average per capita GDP growth in the Reggie region was higher than the rest of the U.S. over the period since the inception of Reggie. Uh, what is the future of Reggie? So honestly, we're proud that Rhode Island was in from the ground floor on a program um, that has provided benefits regionally, benefits locally. Nick will talk more about the investments in the green jobs. So I see us just continuing this program, strengthening the program through decreasing the cap. Um, I believe other states will continue to join the Reggie program. Uh, it's um, a proven success. Um, this kind of cap and trade program that we designed is now a model for other programs. And it is in fact something that we're thinking about, as you know, in the transportation context. We do have um, regular program reviews of Reggie, and I don't want to get into the mechanics too much, but each state enacts a model rule at a state level, and there is a professional entity that runs the auctions, a market monitor, um, a lot of, uh, of oversight and safeguards to make sure the program runs correctly. As mentioned, um, as DEM director, I am on the Reggie board. Uh, previously, the head of the Office of Energy Resources has been on the Reggie board, and Nick is being designated to be on the board, Nick Uchi, the Commissioner of Energy uh, by the governor. Uh, the Office of Air Resources here at DEM 
has promulgated the regulations that allow us to participate in the auctions. We oversee the compliance annually. My team um, at the Office of Air Resources are terrific. They're part of the technical processes and the reviews. Under the statute, the Office of Energy Resources develops and implements the investment plan for REGI. So DEM participates in that. We work in close collaboration with the Office of Energy Resources. And Nick will, oh, that's, um, that's the end of my presentation. Nick will now uh, talk about the investments over time. Um, but I'll pause here to see if there's any questions. Uh, it's really been amazing, the consensus among the states in terms of working together to use Reggie to meet our greenhouse gas reduction goals. Thank you so and much. Thank you, Director. And do the committee members have any questions? Go ahead, Senator Rogers. I apologize. Uh, I, at the beginning of the meeting, I could not hear how if there were any rules set up, so I jumped in halfway through the director's discussion, uh, and I didn't, I was, I didn't catch if we were going to ask questions individually because some of my questions may not be able to be answered by the director, but maybe somebody else down the line. But if you would indulge me, if I could ask a few questions and direct them to the director of DEM uh, to maybe help me, uh, again not my wheelhouse and i've tried to wrap my brain around a lot of these things as they come in and the energy and the puc is all somewhat new to me but it's my understanding that the statement was made that we have five local power plants and they buy carbon credits for the emissions that they put out and over the years our local emissions have have dropped and got cleaner but our transportation costs have gone up i am a small business owner in the state of rhode island that relies heavily on uh, electric heat uh, and, and other things that uh, cost a lot of money, uh, several thousand dollars a month at times. Uh, some of my electric bills are for my businesses. And I have certainly seen tremendous increases. And that may be because of the transportation costs that have gone up. But my question is, as these five power plants try to reduce their emissions, do they somewhat gear down to compensate for that and then we stop buying more electricity, say, from Canada or other areas that aren't participating in this. Are we calculating what percentage they're using that is fossil fuel generated versus green energy? And do we uh, assess that being used by the local five power plants to add to the grid uh, to help that? And again, but I, that's my first question before I move on to the second one. I don't know if anybody can answer that. Thank you, Senator. D Director, did you want to Did you want to take sure, that? Sure, I can answer that. So the five power plants in Rhode Island that participate in REGI are natural gas-fired plants. They're relatively clean, efficient plants compared to many of the older plants in other parts of New England. So, uh, Senator Rogers, that is a um, ISO New England um, has that kind of a competitive process. And the plants in Rhode Island have actually, because they're clean and efficient and natural gas um, has been a fuel that has had increased its footprint in the region. They have been, um, they haven't curtailed their operations under REGI as much as they've just been forced to buy the allowances in order to operate. Um, but it has not, um, because, of, because of the nature of those plants, it hasn't caused them to shift operations. In fact, um, since it's a regional energy market, they've been operating um, you know, throughout um, so the, lo the local impact has um, in many ways been the $90 million in proceeds that have come to reduce energy demand, improve efficiency, uh, invest in other renewable energy sources, but it hasn't shifted the um, supply away from Rhode Island, so to speak. So... Any of the extra energy, if I may, any of the extra energy that's we're coming in as our demand possibly goes up, or it could come out of the region where Reggie isn't participating. Uh, so we could be buying energy that really they're not being forced to clean up their end, but we're have, we have to purchase it. Our, so it, it's kind of like if we shut our five plants down, 
we've solved our problem regionally, but we're buying energy from outside the area to make up for that and really yeah. not solving the problem. Uh, there's something called leakage that we worry about in this program, but all of the New England states are part of Reggie, and we are, Nick may want to illuminate this further, but, and we're part of a, a regional power grid. And as you can see, I could put the slide back up, the extent of the Reggie region, it's really the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. So that is not, it includes New York, which has its own ISO. I understand that problem, but it's not occurring under Reggie right now. Right, so basically we're not getting all our energy that we utilize in Rhode Island from the people involved in Reggie. There is some, I'm assuming, I think it comes from, some of it comes from Canada, that may be some hydropower and maybe some other forms, but all the energy coming in to supplement, because I, I don't believe that we can operate with the five yeah. power plants for our total demand. So that that's what I'm asking that's coming in. Yeah, let me, let me, Nick can get into that further and if he wants to. I think the point is all of the power plants in the Reggie region from a regional basis are, re are reducing their emissions over time, 50% since the beginning of Reggie. Um, and we don't get our power just from the Rhode Island plants, we get our power from a regional grid and they have connections you know, to other regions. But Nick, do you wanna, do you wanna clarify that because it is more in your wheelhouse? Yeah, I was, I was just gonna actually ask Commissioner uh, Uchi if he wanted to weigh in on this question. I'd be happy to. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Nick Ucci, the Commissioner of the Office of Energy Resources. Uh, Senator, there's been a number of factors um, that have contributed to uh, the statistics that uh, Director Coit just mentioned about the reduction in overall emissions. One of them is REGI, is this program that the New England states and other states have agreed to uh, adhere to, which has put downward pressure on uh, local emissions from, from our power plants. The other, in the, in, in the very significant factor that, that has occurred over the last two decades is the um, uh, discovery, if you will, of relatively low uh, cost natural gas within the northeastern region, particularly around Pennsylvania or Ohio. Uh, a couple decades ago, New England was really reliant upon oil fire generation, which, which was an expensive Great. fuel type. Uh, that has, in essence, almost been fully displaced at this point by uh, predominantly natural gas, but over the last, you know, uh, five to eight years, an increasing amount of renewable energy as well. Uh, Reggie program itself, uh, I, I think, has had a de minimis impact on the amount of imports. Uh, so you referenced Canadian hydropower, for example. Um, so I think it's had a de minimis impact on the amount of uh, power that has uh, come into New England from either Canada or New York is the other place where we New England is interconnected to. So I know looking, if I may, I know looking through the chair, looking at many of my electric bills, I think the biggest thing that I've seen a large increase on is uh, we may be saving money on, on energy, but my transportation costs that are wrapped into my bill is what's created a tremendous, tremendous increase in my electric bills. So my concern is, you know, if everybody's not contributing to this, is that the reason why uh, my transportation, I mean, at the end of the day, my bill is what my bill is. Whether it's saving money on creating clean energy and getting hit with a sledgehammer on transportation, it's still an economy killer and, and, and has a detrimental impact on the businesses that I operate. So the transportation costs have gone up. And then it's a double hit because what happens is this also filters down into uh, residential. And I do pay a lot more on a commercial bill than a residential, but on a residential one because that is also increased through the transportation. We get into this situation where now I see a lot of bills starting to come into the, to the Senate that want to start subsidizing low and moderate income electric bills because of what we created. Now, that only adds to me running a business and me as a homeowner now that I'm paying a high transportation, now I'm being taxed at a higher rate through, st through state income tax to subsidize the damage that we've created, not only to me, but now to the people that cannot afford their high rates through their residential, and now I'm being forced to subsidize theirs. At some point, I'm trying to figure out if this was supposed to be good. At one point, where is it going to start getting better? So the transportation costs maybe. Somebody can answer that maybe that's why 
I know that's why my bills are going up, but is this transportation cost not being spoken about because it's damage that we're creating in the direction that we're moving prematurely is what I'm trying to say. Senator, I think, uh, I, first I thought you were talking about transportation, cars and trucks, but you mean the, the transmission of energy, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So the, the, I, I will, I'll again hand off, if it's okay with the chair, to, to uh, Nick Uchi, but the, the transmission and distribution costs of energy are, in my view, not affected at all by the Reggie program. I think that's a separate issue about reliability and, um, you know, moving electrons around. Um, but, uh, Nick, do you want to talk about the transmission issue? Yes, yeah. and I apologize. My five-year-old is trying to make an appearance on TV, so she may wander behind me. Um, Senator, there, there, have, there are a number of components to your energy bill, as, as you know, uh, both as a resident and a small business. We, we all uh, deal with that. Energy itself, uh, those costs have actually decreased substantially over the last uh, several years, and particularly over the last decade, as, as I mentioned earlier, shifting from uh, an oil-based, uh, primary oil-based system to a natural gas system has uh, reduced fuel costs, uh, all else being equal. However, other components of the regional energy system ha have increased in, in, in investment and therefore cost transmission, interstate transmission to flow power from northern Maine uh, all the way down to southern New England. Uh, we are part of that interconnected region here in Rhode Island, and, and so we share in those costs. Local distribution system costs to ensure that uh, the lights stay on, that we have uh, you know, a reliable power system within Rhode Island, those, those costs have increased as well. And, and another key driver is uh, the capacity costs, with, which many uh, small and, and large businesses um, you know, may be familiar with if, if they're working with a competitive supplier. Capacity costs uh, are the costs, are regional-based costs that uh, help support the development of needed uh, power resources, power generators. So uh, over the years, some of those dirtier power plants have uh, closed shop, right? It's, it's a business, so if they're not making money, they don't run, and they close. But other power plants have been built to uh, increase the capacity, ensure that New England has enough power uh, when it needs it at all times of the year. So, so you know, that, and I, you know, I would add you know, public policy costs as well have, have increased, and uh, some of those are passed through utility bills as well, but in many cases... Those costs are investments uh, that, that uh, derive benefits, uh, particularly in the economy and through jobs, over time. But one sitting at their kitchen table or, or in, their bit, you know, in their office sort of paying the electric bill that month, you know, those benefits are not accrued immediately. And so, you, you, know, you have, as you mentioned, sir, uh, you know, you're paying that bill that month, and that's what you're trying to deal with. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And, and Senator, I, I do know that you have additional questions, but I also have questions uh, from other senators. So I want to give um, Senator Coleman the opportunity to ask uh, questions. And if you could also keep in mind, uh, Commissioner Uchi will have a, a presentation as well. Um, so if you have questions for Senator, uh, excuse me, for Director Coit, go ahead, Senator Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, two questions, if, uh, if I may. So the first one, following up on this, question about transmission. Um, I wonder if uh, either Commissioner Ushi or Director Coit could break down a little bit what goes into that cost. It's my understanding that the age of our infrastructure is partly a factor in that, um, but I would appreciate a little bit more clarification if that could be offered. Sure, I'd be happy to do that, Senator. Um, so transmission, when, when I talk about transmission, I'm talking about the interstate transmission system. Uh, that flows power across New England and connects to New York and Canada, uh, and then connects to the local distribution system, which is actually managed by uh, predominantly by National Grid in our state. And um, you are correct. Uh, over the past two decades, New England has invested significantly to the tune of, um, don't hold me to this, but uh, I believe 10 to $12 billion in interstate transmission uh, to accommodate growth in, in demand, uh, you know, as the New England economy has grown and, and those dynamics have shifted, uh, to ensure that we connect uh, you know, new uh, uh, generation resources that have been needed to um, meet our power demands, to ensure that that power can flow reliably uh, across the system. That process is managed uh, by ISO New England, which is the bulk grid operator. 
They also run uh, the uh, energy markets that are behind all, uh, much of this investment. Uh, but, but you are right, the, the, that investment has been substantial and those costs continue to flow to ratepayers uh, beyond the year in which the investment is made. It's spread out over time. And so, um, you know, we all continue to pay for that um, over time. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, Senator Kalman, you had a follow up. Go ahead. Um, it, it was actually a slightly different question, but uh, thank you. This one's for Director Coit. So I'm looking um, at the Reggie Proceeds Report for 2018, which was published um, last July. Uh, so chart one shows that the power sector has seen carbon reductions um, fall from just over 160 tons in 2005 to 80 million um, short tons in 2018. I'm hoping you can sort of give us some dimension for what this means at a re regional level, right? So what's the real world impact? What do these metrics mean? Uh, is this measured at the number of power plants that are closed or energy efficient projects that are completed or clean energy generation? Like, what does that actually look like? So I think you're, um, you're looking at a chart from the report, I think that Nick um, and, and the energy office releases. But in terms of the, the metric tons of carbon from the Reggie footprint, it really is a regional picture. So, you know, any particular plant in the region may not have reduced emissions, but it's taking a look at all of the regulated entities. So we can say, and as Nick mentioned, there's other factors at play in addition to Reggie. Reggie's helped drive this, Reggie's helped accelerate it, but things like shifting to frack natural gas have reduced emissions, coal-fired plants have been shut down. So it's really having the emissions from one sector at a regional level. That's what the chart's about. Thank you, Director. And are there other questions before Commissioner Uchi? Go ahead, Senator DeMario. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, Director, I was wondering, you know, on one of your slides there, it indicated that the Reggie program has um, resulted in a, a, a high number, um, a, a high amount of savings in healthcare costs. And I think that that's something that, you know, we see a lot, like, the, you know, this this will save money in healthcare costs. And I was wondering if maybe, um, kind of similar to Senator Coleman's question, you could give a little bit of information about where are those savings realized? I mean, you know, because we can imagine things like, um, you know, healthcare costs for, for people who are um, on health insurance that is paid for by tax dollars, but, but what else do those healthcare savings look like in terms of that real world impact? Thanks for the question. So the really, the slide I, I showed was from a study of healthcare costs avoided. So it was assessing um, things like um, uh, hospital visits due to asthma attacks, um, shortened lifespan due to polluted air, and an assessment of what are the healthcare costs avoided by people who would otherwise have been infect affected by um, polluted air. So I can send you a more detailed description of the study that was used, but that's the type of thing that's typically used in a regulatory context to look at if we reduce uh, mercury emissions, you know, what are the healthcare costs avoided by not having people get sick and affected by air pollution? Thank you, Thank Director. You so are there any other questions before we move to Commissioner Uchi? Okay, I don't see any. And um, next, we welcome uh, Nicholas Uchi, Commissioner for the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources. He's already been helping us weigh in on questions. And so, thank you so much for joining us, Commissioner. If you want to go ahead. Great, thank you. Let me uh, pull up my slide deck here. Give me one moment, please. Great. Can you see my full slides? Sure can. Uh, and you're seeing my, my, uh, my notes as well, apparently. So let me go back to uh, full screen here. Hold on one second. Okay, there we go. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Nicholas Ucci. I'm the Commissioner of the Office of Energy Resources. Uh, I've been working on uh, energy-related issues for the state uh, for more than 12 years now uh, in a variety of, of roles. Uh, the Office of Energy Resources uh, is the lead state energy policy agency. Our mission is to lead the state toward a clean, affordable, reliable, and 
more equitable energy future. Uh, we work uh, closely uh, with uh, many state agencies and, and state regulators, including uh, D Director Coy in the Department of Environmental Management, uh, to advance environmental sustainability, energy security, and uh, importantly, uh, and increasingly so, our clean energy economy. As Director Coit mentioned, uh, responsibilities for REGI are, are divided in, in two. Uh, Director Coit mentioned that uh, you know, DEM is, is primarily responsible for the regulatory side uh, of the REGI program. Uh, the General Assembly has designated the Office of Energy Resources uh, as the agency that um, develops uh, allocation plans and investment plans for the proceeds that the state receives on a periodic basis. Uh, generally, there are four auctions held per year. Uh, the assembly has also been uh, quite uh, specific in the allowable uses for the proceeds that the state re receives, and I think that's been to our benefit. Um, there's uh, six uh, items listed here. Uh, generally speaking, the proceeds have been invested in uh, cost-effective energy efficiency uh, programs and renewable technologies. Uh, I would note that um, there are also uh, allowed for administrative costs uh, in the bill, which I'll go through in a moment. We have a uh, public process around how we develop our allocation plans and, and ultimately implement them. Uh, generally, we have been allocating the state proceeds on a biannual basis, which allows us to be a, a little more nimble than, than on an annual basis, for example, and allows us to invest that money and get it into the economy a, a little quicker. We also uh, at OER are very cognizant of trying to leverage these dollars. And so uh, we do that in a number of ways. Uh, I'll talk in a moment about uh, some programs where we leverage system benefit charge monies that are collected by uh, local uh, ratepayers and, and programs that are administered by National Grid. I, I know they're on the agenda uh, in a little bit. Uh, there are uh, state capital budgets that we try to leverage where possible, um, and certainly a consumer and um, public sector uh, capital as well that we uh, you know, look to try to take a Reggie dollar and turn it into two or three or four. And finally, we, uh, you know, I think have a, a good grounding here at OER uh, about the energy system and the direction in which the state is moving. And so we're looking, uh, when we receive our REGI proceeds, we're looking for ways to fill gaps in our, in our suite of clean energy programs and laws and spur investment in new technologies that we know will be critical to reducing emissions uh, consistent with the Act on Climate. So OER uh, primarily drafts the plan in consultation with uh, DEM, as Director Coit mentioned earlier. And we post that plan on our website and uh, accept uh, public comment. And um, pursuant to our regulations, uh, we hold a public hearing af after at least 30 days and then grant some additional time for additional public comment following that public hearing, uh, after which point uh, we can finalize our plan and uh, our investment strategy. I wanna stop there on process, uh, Chair, this may be a good time to ask for questions. Uh, and then I'll move into some slides that highlight uh, some of the investments and in, in strategies that we have undertaken uh, in recent years. Thank you, Commissioner. Do any of the members have any questions? Uh, Senator Valverde, I think I saw your hand up. Yep, Senator Valverde, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about like the public participation in the allocation process. Like, is, it a, is there robust public participation? Um, how many co comments do you normally get and how much participation is there in that public hearing? Thank you for that question, Senator. We generally have a few uh, re uh, consistent contributors, uh, local environmental organizations and advocacy organizations who do follow this work closely. Uh, we also um, discuss our uh, allocation plans at the uh, public meetings for, for the Energy Efficiency and Resource Management Council, because a lot of our investment does touch upon uh, energy efficiency programs, that is generally a good forum to also get the word out. And we have increasingly been committing dollars toward our renewable energy programs. 
And so uh, there are regular stakeholder meetings by the Renewable Energy Fund at Commerce Rhode Island, for which uh, OER helps, uh, helps them administer that, that uh, program. And so we use those stakeholder forums to note uh, proposed investment strategies and welcome comment. Thank you. Are there any follow-up questions? Just trying to scroll through and make sure that I'm not missing any raised hands. Um, I think we're good, Commissioner, if you want to continue. Thank you, Chair. So uh, as Director Coit mentioned, all of the Reggie states uh, since Reggie's inception uh, have had proceeds of about $4 billion. Rhode Island has received about 87 million uh, of that since 2009. I have a slide here in a moment that uh, I sort of isolated the last five years uh, to give a, a bit of a snapshot and, and try to put this data into some context. Uh, since between calendar year 2016 and calendar year 20, the state collected $34 million in gross proceeds. To that, OER has been uh, in, uh, holding those funds in interest-bearing accounts, and that has generated an additional uh, $725,000, which we apply to investment. We do not take any of that. We apply it directly to investment and add to our uh, pool of capital. Uh, we have, uh, in this period, uh, collected uh, some administrative costs for DEM and OER as allowed for by statute. We'll talk about that in a minute. And there are some, uh, on an annual basis, uh, some of our proceeds are given to the administrative organization that helps oversee, implement Reggie, and conduct market monitoring. That's Reggie Inc., as you can see there, about $200,000 uh, in costs over that uh, period. And so that's left about $31 million uh, for investment. And, and I'll get back to that in a moment. This chart here shows the state's uh, auction proceeds over time on an annual basis. And I wanted to, to show this chart just to give you a sense that it's, this is a market-based mechanism. Uh, as Director Quite mentioned, uh, you know, there, there is a, a carbon price set through the Reggie program, but based upon uh, you know, supply and demand, that price can fluctuate. And as the price fluctuates, of course, the amount of proceeds that the state receives also fluctuates. So we've had some years where we've been uh, very robust in the amount of revenue the state has received. Of course, 2015 stands out here. And then we went through a period where revenues uh, declined significantly. And we, uh, you know, we had to account for that uh, at, at OER and, and through our investment plans. So going back to that uh, 34 million net proceed amount, uh, what I did here is I, I, I sort of grouped our investments by a major category. And you'll see that uh, you know, we have about a quarter, more than a quarter of the uh, uh, monies have been invested in renewable-based programs. That includes supporting the Renewable Energy Fund, which supports small and commercial uh, PV, solar PV and renewable uh, installations. We are increasingly shifting capital towards supporting uh, solar brownfields and solar carports. Uh, the reason for that is that those projects are, are generally um, more, more expensive uh, than say a rooftop project or a ground mounted project. But it, those projects have the benefit of being more environmentally sustainable, uh, reducing the amount of tree cutting and clearing, for example, that might be necessary to develop a solar project. And so we've provided some incentives to spur investment in those areas. Uh, uh, the other significant portion of course is in the blue and that's around energy efficiency. I'll give you some examples uh, of how, uh, you know, some of the programs that we've invested there. Uh, in some cases, uh, again, we have leveraged uh, ratepayer dollars uh, that are collected by National Grid for our statewide energy efficiency programs to really drive and accelerate uh, investment reductions in consumer energy costs and of course, emission reductions as well. Uh, we don't have to walk through this. I'll, I'm gonna provide a few snapshots in a moment, but this is just a small sampling of the types of initiatives that we have supported through uh, our Reggie funding. We've made significant investments in the public sector. Uh, we know that the public sector entities, including the state, municipalities, fire districts, do not have the capital uh, to invest in clean energy projects. Many of those projects often pay for themselves, 
but due to a number of, of financial barriers, which I know this, this General Assembly and this committee are familiar with uh, for the state budget, um, sometimes they're, they're, they're not prioritized. And so we've been able to use the Reggie Capital to get those projects prioritized, to help these public sector entities get over that upfront capital barrier. And, uh, you know, these projects reduced public sector energy costs in consumption and operating and maintenance costs. Uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, we try to do uh, some innovative stuff. So we've established the state's state government's first storage incentive program, as well as its first microgrid incentive program. Um, there's a number of other uh, items here that uh, I'll touch upon momentarily. I mentioned that uh, administrative costs uh, are allowed to be recovered through the program. This is uh, just some, some information about Reggie Inc., which is the entity that oversees the entire Reggie uh, uh, program on behalf of all of the states who participate. And uh, critically, DEM and OER are also authorized to share administrative funds uh, from our Reggie auction proceeds. Uh, I, I want to stress, particularly in an, in an era now post Act on Climate passage, this revenue is absolutely vital to an agency like OER. Uh, at times, it has represented over a quarter of our uh, restricted receipts budget. Uh, and it, this allows us to work on a variety of other initiatives uh, that uh, go beyond uh, electricity uh, or, or delivered fuels, but extend out to transportation, the heating sector. And Chair, with the time I have remaining, I just want to spotlight a couple of investment uh, strategies and programs that we've worked on over the last several years. Uh, this is one that we're particularly proud of uh, in, as I mentioned, sort of supporting local cities and towns in getting over those capital barriers to invest in these cost-saving programs, which often result in immediate energy and operating and maintenance cost savings. Uh, to date, on the Streetlight Program, we've supported uh, 31 municipalities and fire districts. We've also supported Pasco and Bl the Block Island Utility Districts in retrofitting their entire uh, Streetlight uh, portfolio in, in those two important communities. Uh, you can see here, some, you know, we've taken $2.5 million in Reggie, and we've catalyzed $4.5 million in estimated lifetime energy savings for those public sector entities and we've leveraged available incentives by National Grid, uh, which are also paid for, you know, paid for by consumers, but we've been able to leverage that to take that you know, $1 in Reggie and turn it to two or three. Similarly, on the, on the state side, if you've driven uh, across the highways over the last few years, you've noticed uh, an improvement in, I hope you've noticed an improvement in lighting quality and the fact that the lights are on. And that's because we've worked very closely with DOT to convert all state road, roadway streetlights to high efficiency LEDs and controls, which gives DOT the ability uh, to have uh, you know, better control over the lighting quality and consistency across the state. Uh, we've again leveraged some utility dollars there, and we anticipate that this project will result in $11 million in estimated lifetime energy savings for the state budget. It's pretty, pretty substantial along with the CO2 reduction associated with it and the operating and maintenance costs savings that are not included on this slide that Director Alvidi and his team uh, will certainly be benefiting from for, uh, for years to come. But this is one very, very relevant, of course, uh, to, to the times that we're in uh, during the COVID pandemic, particularly last year when the economy uh, slowed down and uh, you know, a lot of the weatherization work that occurs uh, and that I, I think Vin will be talking about momentarily uh, had to be paused, you know, until we had a better uh, un understanding and handle around safety protocols. We, we also know that COVID has had a, a substantial impact on uh, all Rhode Islanders and, and Rhode Island businesses, particularly small businesses and low and moderate income consumers. And so uh, very, uh, this gets back to trying, trying to be nimble and giving us some, some leeway uh, within the authorized uses that the assembly has set forward uh, for us. We've gone ahead and allocated Reggie money to provide 100% cost coverage for insulation and air sailing for small businesses and moderate income Rhode Islanders. This project is uh, now in development and, and being implemented and it will provide, help provide immediate uh, monthly energy bill savings and support, importantly, support local clean energy jobs and firms. 
Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, our investment uh, for state government has also been significant. Uh, this go we started this effort back in around 2015 when Governor Mundo at the time challenged us uh, and challenged the state to lead by example in the adoption of clean energy measures. So there's a number of uh, uh, success stories listed here at the bottom of the slide, uh, many of which are quite visible, particularly to uh, those on Capitol Hill, uh, solar panels on, on the Powers Building, DOT, and health uh, facilities, uh, the highway streetlights that I mentioned. Uh, we've supported the, uh, the Army Rhode Island Army National Guard uh, with install installing the largest uh, state government solar project at, at their barracks. And uh, these, again, projects that have immediate cost savings and budget, you know, positive budget implications uh, for our state agencies, which benefit all, all taxpayers. Uh, this is a slide I mentioned earlier, solar brownfields. Uh, I know Director Coit knows this challenge well. Uh, as our clean uh, renewable energy resources accelerate in number, we're coming up against a constraint with other uses of land, particularly unfragmented forest land. And so we're trying to use REGI to incentivize investment uh, in more sustainable renewable solutions, such as uh, placing solar on brownfields, uh, which also, by the way, generally oft often increases tax base for the local community, uh, as well as solar carports, which take brown space parking lots that have already been developed, already cleared, and putting canopies over them with solar panels to generate clean energy. And we've done a number of projects, uh, solar carport projects uh, across four communities to date. I won't spend time here, but we're certainly moving toward energy storage. This is one of the key recommendations out of the report we released back in December on the state reaching 100% renewables by 20, uh, 2030. Uh, one that uh, I'll close with this because I think I'm up against it, uh, but this one we're really, really excited about. And we're partnering with, with Rhode Island Housing and National Grid to offer grants for uh, developers to design and construct affordable, energy efficient housing to serve low and moderate income Rhode Islanders. And Reggie is critical to this because it's providing the grant money that's necessary to drive this type of investment. And uh, these affordable housing units will have uh, solar PV and uh, air source heat pumps, which are you know a clean heating technology. Uh, we've already had a first round of pro first round of projects awarded in North Kingston, Providence, and on Aquidneck Island. We have another round coming up uh, with Rhode Island Housing uh, later this month. Uh, just to close. Um, looking at the Reggie dollars that we've invested since 2019. Uh, we, we've been able to uh, uh, calculate uh, these, these positive benefits. Significant avoided CO2, uh, significant amount of electricity avoided, and, and, and the related energy cost savings that accrue to consumers and, and to public sector entities. Uh, this is not, again, this is not insignificant. Uh, it has been a catalyst, a key driver in uh, the state's ability to invest uh, in, in these policies and in these programs, it's discretionary money that otherwise would never have been invested. And so uh, for that, we're very grateful for Reggie. And um, other states, I, I can tell you, have very similar success stories. And, and if it weren't for Reggie, uh, we wouldn't have them. So with that, uh, Chair, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you and take any questions. Thank you so much for for that presentation, Commissioner. Um, I do know that Senator Coleman does have a question for you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and Commissioner. Um, first of all, it's great to see the carports. I represent Pawtucket, and I remember when that project was approved maybe a year and a half ago. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about was the affordable housing, the green affordable housing, which is a really exciting program to me. So. How many affordable units when were funded by this program in the first round and how many do you anticipate being funded in the second round? Uh, great question, Senator, thank you. Uh, in the first round, we supported uh, four projects, one, I, one of which I believe is under construction. Um, the one in North Kingstown is a single story duplex rental for seniors 55 and older. Um, that's uh, with the company Caldwell and Johnson. Uh, we have a, a project that we're supporting Church Community Housing Corporation to construct eight single family homes 
in Jamestown and, and through Aquidneck Island. Seven of those homes will be new construction, and one includes the rehabilitation of an existing building. And the uh, other project in, uh, in the Onlyville section of Providence is by One Neighborhood Builders, and that's for five small single-family solar-powered homes. So these, uh, these projects are still under, the work, un under works, uh, but the money has been committed, the grants have been awarded, and uh, you know, we're excited about the potential for round two later this month. Go ahead, Senator Common, for the follow-up. Thank you so much. That's super helpful. How many do you think will be in round two? Is it comparable money in the second yes. round? Yes. Yes. I mean, it'll all, of course, you know, be dependent upon the, you know, the design and, and, and the bids that are submitted. But, um, you know, I, I'm hopeful for, uh, you know, similar results. And Senator Miller? Yes. Um, I don't know if you have the ability to go back. Um, to slides, but you had the pie chart on the, uh, that showed the different types of projects you were supporting. Um, I was just wondering how that those sectors are determined and um, what influences, um, you know, how much you're investing in renewables, how much you're investing in residential. Um, yeah, that was the slide I was interested in. Um, there. Yeah. So you, you, who has input and in what, um, you know, determines how much in each sector? And do you also collaborate? I know there's other revenue coming in. That, that grid has a commitment to um, energy efficiency programs, and that might be part of the uh, presentations we haven't heard yet, but is there collaboration with those funds to um, have larger, more impactful projects? Well, it's good to see you again, Senator Miller, and thank you for the question. Yeah, so one of the benefits of having OER draft the allocation plans is that we're involved in all of that work. We're involved in uh, all of the development of the energy efficiency uh, programs and investments. We are intricately involved in the transformation of the heating and transportation sectors uh, and, and, of course, uh, you know, the acceleration of renewable energy resources. And so we take that knowledge and awareness as well as our understanding of existing uh, programs and funding streams. And we try to leverage that knowledge in the development of, of those allocation plans. And so again, we're looking for areas where we might be able to fill a gap where there might not be investment through state programs such as storage or microgrids uh, or incentivizing solar on brownfields, uh, which you know, isn't directly supported uh, to the level necessary to drive that investment through, through existing channels. Uh, and uh, yes, absolutely, particularly on the energy efficiency side, we leverage as much as possible with the dollars collected from ratepayers uh, and administered by National Grid in the statewide energy efficiency programs that most people are familiar about, uh, familiar with, excuse me. Thank you, Commissioner. And I apologize, I uh, needed to switch the view to make sure that I wanted to see if uh, Senator Miller had a follow-up. Um, so I, he does not, and so Senator Valverde had a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, Commissioner, I was, uh, that slide that you showed, I believe, which is before the one that is currently up, um, that showed the, um, the different uh, yearly proceeds, auction proceeds, and I was sort of surprised to see the kind of wild fluctuations there. Could you talk a little bit about kind of what causes that? You know, why, why, you know, in 2017, it's only, you know, 3 million, whereas a couple of years before it was over 12 million? Sure, and let me invite Director Coit uh, into this conversation as well. Uh, as, as Director Coit mentioned, on a periodic basis, the entire Reggie program is reviewed and uh, caps are established, uh, alloc uh, uh, pollution, uh, uh, CO2 uh, um, allowances are redistributed across the Reggie states. And so some of that dip you see there is associated with that. But, but let me invite Director Coit for additional comments. Yes, I think uh, part of it is just um, it's a market-based program. And what does the um, market determine is the price. It's been as low as under $2 for a ton of carbon. That was the first few auctions. So the cap was higher then, and, it, um, and uh, the, um, 
the, the price was much lower. The last auction, as I mentioned, it was $7.60 for a ton of carbon. So I think there's both that people will plan ahead and, and buy, or they just sort of put, play the market. So, um, so the price has gone, you know, I, I think the same would be true of some other cap and trade programs, uh, that, but it's, you know, basically from a little under $2 up to close to $8 and it's gone back and forth. Um, but it, partly it's just, you know, I think the market's an efficient way of, of dealing with this and it's at the wholesale level. Um, so it's kind of how people engage in it or deciding when to buy allowances. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me add, you know, the, the chart, the dip you see there, it, it's not in any way associated with Rhode Island not getting its share, for example. It's just a, fun, it's a function of price. And so, um, you know, other states saw a dip in their uh, proceeds as well. And there's two ways. Let me add one thing. There's kind of two ways. The cap goes, is going down. It's a declining cap. But as uh, but companies can move to lower carbon fuels, um, you know, so there's, it's not that some, sometimes the, there's more allowances available if companies have made decisions to do something different. So hopefully the cap is both defining a reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions overall, which it absolutely is, but also inducing people to make decisions to shift to lower carbon fuels. So a coal-fired plant that might switch to convert to natural gas, for example, and then they need fewer allowances. Are the allowances um, sort of transferable year over year? Yes, the, they get true, yes, you, you acquire them and then there's a period of kind of truing up the system. So you, you purchase them and then the Reggie program takes a look at, did you have enough allowances for the period of time based on your emissions? And so some people will quote bank allowances some companies, you know, buy them ahead of time if the price is low so that they have them in future years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do not see any further questions from committee members. And so with that, I think we're going to move to our next presenter. And so we have Jeffrey Deal, Deal with us. He's the executive director of the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank. And so Jeffrey, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to go ahead with your presentation. And thank you so much, Director, for joining us. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Oyer and uh, members of the committee. Uh, I want to first commend uh, Director Coit and Commissioner Ucci on their technical skills of being able to share the screen uh, with their presentation with uh, minimal input. I hope I can do the same, although uh, I think I'm less practiced. So, hold on. Okay. Can uh, everybody see my uh, screens? Yes, we can. Well done. Great. I feel pretty good about myself now. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, this will be very short. Uh, you know, I was asked really to speak about uh, the Infrastructure Bank's uh, experience with Reggie, uh, also a bit about what we're doing in uh, renewable energy, uh, clean energy investment, and uh, a bit about kind of where we see uh, from the Infrastructure Bank's point of view, uh, looking forward. Um, you know, for those of us that don't know us, uh, the Infrastructure Bank is a hub of local infrastructure investment uh, for predominantly for municipalities, although we do some commercial clean energy as well. Uh, we invest in water infrastructure, transportation, clean energy, brownfields, and climate uh, resiliency. Um, <clears throat> So our major investment in uh, clean energy is really through what's called the Efficient Building Fund, and that's uh, really a municipal clean energy investment fund uh, uh, designed to lend money at below market rates to municipalities and other quasi-state agencies and, and uh, technically also the public universities uh, to finance clean energy projects. The fund was established by the General Assembly in uh, 2015 and the initial capitalization that was directed to the fund uh, was $3 million of Reggie proceeds and $1.8 million of system benefit charges, which is 
charge on the electric bill. It's been referred to already. And I'm sure National Grid will go into that in greater detail. Uh, in 2016, when the program really started running, uh, the Office of Energy Resources authorized a, a further allocation of $2 million of Red Sheet funds. And we also received uh, an allocation of 500000 in 2017 and another 500000 in 2018 for a total of $6 million. Uh, that's all that we've received uh, to date uh, since then. Uh, we like the Reggie funds uh, for the efficient building fund because it can support both energy efficiency and renewable energy uh, investments. Uh, funds we receive from the system benefit charge can only support energy efficiency loans. And then the, on the system benefit charges, in addition to the original 1.8 million, uh, we've received uh, from the energy efficiency plan $5 million in each of the years of 2017, 18, 19, 20, in the plan that was recently uh, approved within the last couple of weeks, uh, provided another $5 million for the Efficient Building Fund. Since the fund was set up in 2015, we've provided 18 loans across 14 municipal borrowers for a total of almost $61 million in project costs. You know, that's versus a total capital of $26.2 million received from Reggie system benefit charges, and the infrastructure bank itself has contributed a small amount of capital. But it, uh, in terms of the types of loans we've made, uh, projects, 76% of those have been energy efficiency, 6% have been renewable energy only, and 18% have been mixed uh, projects for both uh, uh, energy efficiency and uh, renewables, and you can see in the picture the uh, Westerly uh, Department of Public Works garage had uh, both inside energy efficiency and inside the building, as well as solar rooftops. Um, also, to put it in perspective, we've we've lent 13.2 million dollars in renewable energy, which has been supported by the six million dollars of uh, uh, Reggie funds that have been allocated to the fund. Uh, we run a leveraged program, which that mean what that means is we uh, take the loans that we make to municipalities and we use that as effectively collateral to borrow from the market. And so, as I said, we've lent $61 million with $26 million of capital, which is uh, we've mobilized almost $35 million in private sector capital to enable us to continue to make loans. The, uh, these loans are uh, uh, what is referred to in efficient building fund cost effective. In other words, the savings uh, realized by these investments in clean energy projects exceed the, uh, the, the cost of the financing. And we've, uh, we've uh, saved our municipalities, you know, annual savings of $6.8 million and reduced energy cost of, costs and reduced uh, uh, emissions equivalent to 1,320 homes. Uh, and of course, that investment uh, is, uh, in infrastructure has also created or supported uh, about 900 jobs. Our portfolio of uh, or pipeline of projects uh, is uh, is growing. Uh, we have about 20 million dollars in municipal projects that we have in terms of pipeline potential pipeline over the next couple of years. Uh, we hope that all, if most, if not all, will come to us. Some will be financed. Uh, uh, perhaps by other opportunities and also uh, by cash flow municipalities. You know, as we see money coming from the federal government, uh, that might fund some of these projects. But we've also really started a, a robust initiative with uh, the, the you know, investment in schools. In fact, we lent $24 million to East Providence for their uh, high school project for the uh, energy components of that, uh, which saved them about a million and a half dollars. You know, we've actually been investing in, in clean energy for quite some time, uh, even before the Efficient Building Fund. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, we're seeing increased uh, retrofits and deploying new age technologies you know, in the transit infrastructure and water. Our clean, clean Water State Revolving Fund has been making investments. In fact, we financed the wind turbines at Narragansett Bay Commission's uh, Fields Point. Uh, Drinking Water State Revolving Fund has also financed uh, uh, clean energy projects at uh, drinking water facilities. Again, the efficient building fund, and we also have what's called a commercial property assessed clean energy program, 
which provides financing for commercial properties and nonprofits in the state, uh, everywhere from small uh, housing nonprofits to uh, things as large as uh, hotels and uh, hospitals. Now, one of the things, despite the success of these programs, we do feel that uh, you know access to funding and financing for clean energy is still inaccessible to many in Rhode Island. Uh, you know, in terms of increasing service delivery, we've identified uh, a number of market financing gaps and opportunities. And you know, we heard Commissioner Bucci talk about uh, grants and funding. Uh, we'll hear more, I think, from National Grid in this area. But one, and we also heard Commissioner Uchi refer to this as well, is if you don't have the money up front, you can have incentives. But if you don't have the money to invest, uh, projects are difficult to get off the ground. And that's really a lot in the municipal space what the Efficient Building Fund was meant to do, which is provide money uh, up front to our municipalities to do these projects where they can not only reduce the environmental impact of what their uh, energy uses, usage is, but save money. Uh, we certainly want to continue to encourage local governments and their associated utilities to accelerate phasing out older and inefficient assets. Uh, we want to remove barriers for small businesses to access capital and technical expertise. We do continue to think there's a financing gap for small businesses, especially minority-owned and uh, uh, women-owned businesses and small businesses and disadvantaged communities. Uh, you know, we do want to be, we do feel that uh, there is a financing challenge in the, the shift from fossil fuels to electricity being the heat pump technology, which Commissioner Uchi referred to earlier. And we also feel there's a financing gap for uh, uh, residential clean energy in disadvantaged communities and also continues to be in multifamily housing. And we heard a little bit about how OER is done. Uh, you know, we feel that delivery and accessibility should prioritize communities hit hardest by the COVID-19. And as I talked about earlier, uh, minority and women-owned businesses, uh, especially small businesses and disadvantaged communities, we do feel there's a financing gap. Uh, legislation has been uh, submitted by uh, uh, Senator Pearson and uh, Representative Kazarian, which would direct uh, some of the system benefit charges directly to the infrastructure bank, which would enable us to direct more programs into this clean energy. That legislation would also expand our capacity and authorizations to to provide more financing plans uh, subsidized financing plans for clean energy investment across the state and with that i'll uh, wrap up and uh, answer any questions thank you director are there any questions from committee members uh senator miller has one go ahead senator yeah i wonder um, mr deal if you could talk about the scale of the infrastructure bank versus demand that you might speculate is out there and what it would take to get closer to demand? Um, well, I think, you know, again, a lot of this, a lot of what we've looked at across the sector is that at the moment uh, we don't have authorizations to invest in. Um, you know, I think there's, uh, I can't really give you a number, but I can look into that and provide you more information, the committee more information on this. Uh, you know, at the moment, uh, you know, we do have, even in the municipal space, we feel that over the next, you know, 18 months to uh, three years, a, a significant investment, I think it shows some of that, $180 million or $160 million, $80 million, we think there's more out there uh, uh, in terms of potential projects. And, uh, you know, we're receiving at the moment from the energy efficiency plan about $5 million in capital. And so Sorry. I think when we... You know, when we look at even the broader sector, there is a significant demand for clean energy investment. Uh, and for us, we just at the moment don't have the capital. That's part of why Senator Pearson has uh, uh, submitted his legislation to re direct more funds to us to provide uh, subsidized financing programs. Yeah, yeah, that's my point. Does How close does Senator Pearson's legislation um, get to uh, filling that capital gap? Um, I think it will go a long way. You know, I think the, uh, the percentage that's in the uh, uh, legislation would direct something like $20 million. So that would be a fourfold increase in the capital that we're currently uh, receiving from the energy efficiency plan. And just one other short question. In your application process, do the currently least efficient projects, uh, you know, status of a, like a school down the street from me, I toured that project with you a couple of years ago. It was one of the first mm -hmm. projects for the bank. 
And um, so, so that the least efficient current status of um, a heating system or whatever the loan is for get priority versus something that's uh, more efficient? Yeah, the, the process we have in the Efficient Building Fund is similar to all of our other programs. Uh, you, know, you know, we're out soliciting every day, uh, uh, you know, interest and in borrowing from the program and participating to access the below market funding. We also, by the way, we pay for a uh, uh, consulting engineering firm that we offer municipalities free of charge, municipalities and school districts, to help them, uh, you know, on an agenda-free basis understand uh, how they can look at energy. In fact, we've just issued an RFP and gotten responses. We're going to take it to the next level where the engineering firm we retain is going to provide uh, energy asset management consulting uh, to municipalities. But when municipalities look at the projects that they want to finance, they submit uh, the project to the Office of Energy Resources. Uh, OER then uh, has a transparent grading scale that they then uh, provide a priority list to each of those projects. So yes, uh, the projects that would be submitted, the least efficient ones, uh, the ones that uh, would typically score higher. And then we solicit applications for loans from that list. And uh, if we have insufficient capital, we will make a loan to the, you know, down the list until we get to, uh, uh, till we run out of capital. Hopefully we, uh, you know, frankly to date, we really have not, I'll have to say, in the East Providence High School project. Uh, they applied for $28 million. Uh, we only were able to accommodate 24 because we had other loans uh, uh, that had made applications in there as well. So I just want to make a, a plug for this kind of program. I think it's really, really important, um, especially when you talk about school buildings. It, uh, the project down the street from you is a relatively small elementary school and it saved the school system of Cranston hundreds of thousands of dollars in energy costs the first year it was fully operational versus the year um, so you know we save school systems hundreds of thousands of dollars every time one of these projects uh, is fully operational yeah, I think, you know, the, the Edgewood Highland School project you're referring to, that's, uh, you know, one of my favorite projects in terms of uh, uh, EBF and uh, uh, its ability to, to really drive savings. You know, we, we've focused a lot on schools recently. We have a very good model that's been developed for new construction uh, uh, that we developed in East Providence. Edgewood Highland is a good example of, uh, uh, you know, a retrofit uh, you know, we work closely with uh, RIDE and financial advisors and the engineering firms to ensure that schools and school districts retain all of the housing aid, the, you know, the state subsidies that come to school districts for uh, financing projects and all of the incentives that come, plus any incentives that might come from uh, National Grid or even some of the OER programs and still enable us to, uh, uh, you know, still lend at below market to save them significant money on the interest rate as well. Thank you. And uh, Director Deal, if I could get you to unshare your screen, it's actually... Oh, um, sorry. That, that's okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm having some... Uh, the uh, For some reason, my uh, things shrunk and then... Uh, <laughs> uh, see no. if I can actually get this done. I apologize. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing any uh, committee members. And also, I don't think our next presenter will be able to share while, while you are still sharing. Okay, is that now stopped? Or is that still going on? Looks like it's still shared. Okay, I'm, uh, apologize, I'm, uh, having some te technical difficulty in getting this off. We're also trying to assess if we can help you from, yeah. from the host end as yeah. well. Oh, here we go, here we go.
Got it. Sorry. Thank you so much, Director. Are there any other questions before we move to our next presenter? Oh, Senator DeMario, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Deal. The explanation that you were just giving about the demand for um, for the, the, the programs um, that, that you're in charge of actually just brings to mind a question, and I don't know if maybe the commissioner or, or Director Coit could jump back in about this one, but I'm just wondering about um, a kind of uptake in these programs that are offered overall. So for example, um, you know, Commissioner, you mentioned things like um, programs for um, helping homeowners install heat pumps, things like that. Um, what is the, the usage um, of, of those programs? Do you have enough homeowners that are interested in taking advantage of, of that opportunity? Is, you know, do you feel like those things are well promoted to the public? Um, I'd, I'd appreciate any input you have on that. Uh, certainly, Senator, from, from my perspective, um, <clears throat> there's more uh, demand than there are funding uh, funds. Uh, and in, con in the context of the Act on Climate, there's certainly uh, uh, not enough capital in the system today to drive the sort of transformation across the entire energy space, right, electricity, uh, nap uh, uh, transportation, and heating. Uh, that will be required to meet those goals. And so uh, the funding we have today is, is very significant and the suite of programs and policies that the assembly has put together is absolutely vital uh, to our continued success. But um, in isolation, it, you know, it won't be enough. And so we need to continue to innovate, to find new ways as, um, as Jeff mentioned, to um, you know, drive uh, financing, low cost financing where possible uh, to support uh, residents and, and businesses to adopt and take on these clean energy investments. And we know we need to ensure that the, the, that the state and the government uh, provides, uh, you know, helpful incentives that drive market investment in the direction we need it to. Senator, if I may just offer one other um, reaction to that, which is with the Act on Climate's mandatory emissions goals, it's really... Uh, um, Senator Rogers will appreciate this. It's like a silver buckshot approach. There's no one thing that will uh, allow us to achieve our goals. And, you know, we've talked about Reggie, which has helped tremendously in the electric sector, which we're trying to decarbonize. But the transportation sector is the biggest sector. The heating sector is going to take a lot of time to transform. So I think we've seen that the programs we have have a lot of demand um, and that the Act on Climate is going to require us to update our economy-wide greenhouse gas reduction plan. Um, but um, to, to emphasize one point Nick made earlier, the administrative cost portion of REGI, you know, has allowed for a stable, sustainable funding stream to actually plan and execute. And those are the kinds of things we're going to need to do in an innovative and a sustainable way in the other sectors. And if I could just make one more point. And I think uh, Senator Rogers sort of uh, maybe touched upon this at the very beginning of, of the hearing tonight. You know, the investments that we make today or we're asking consumers to support today, many of them will absolutely pay long-term energy, economic, and environmental um, you know, positive outcomes. But those, those benefits are accrued over a long period of time. And so when you're sitting like I do with my kids at the kitchen table to pay the electric bill, right? That's not the mindset that an average family or an average business owner has. Now, that's, that's all of our jobs, right? Your, your jobs as legislators, ours as you know, uh, um, you know, folks in state government, to, to make sure that those value propositions do come to fruition. Uh, but you know, that, that's a constraint that, that I think you know, we, we, there's, there's always tension there, uh, particularly in light of the act on climate and, and you know, where we, we know we need to go. Uh, the other thing I'll add here is that uh, both in the electric and in the heating sector, uh, certainly we have done a lot of foundational work. Uh, we issued uh, two major reports over the last two years uh, in those sectors, respectively, that really create a you know a pathway for Rhode Island to achieve the sorts of emission reductions we know we're need, we're going to need to to achieve. But it's going to take um, you know uh, behavioral changes and uh, significant investment to get there. Go ahead, Senator Rogers. Along, along of a statement, I, I see, uh, again, we can't meet this goal unless we also front load part of this program is to get green energy uh, on board, solar, wind, 
and all of that type to, to, you know, hit it from two different points. And what I see coming to municipal, and, and there's a bill coming up tomorrow night I'm going to be uh, speaking against because as stakeholders, the urban areas that have to host a lot of, so we do talk about car ports and rooftops, but at the end of the day, the urban areas, which I represent a lot of, my areas are ur- urban, are taking that brunt of the hit to host large parcels of the solar, which is a major component to moving this process along. And it it's being, unfortunately, you know, we're stakeholders to it. If there's no financial gain for us, which keeps getting eroded time and time again by lobbyists putting caps in the legislature allowing uh, the funds to not funnel to the municipalities to host this, it's it's an adversary position where you're going to get the urban communities that are that are not they're not going to be coming along with this friendly. They have to reap some of the benefits to host this, and uh, we've got a long way to go with that. We're going in the wrong direction, and you come out here, people don't want this, and if they don't, if you don't make it palatable to them, where they somewhat benefit for hosting these, instead of going the other way. It, it's going to turn into a, a, a dangerous element where you know cities and towns and zoning is already making it restrictive because they're basically being stripped of any benefit, and it's wrong. Uh, and yet we're hosting it. And I and I brought it up on other issues. We're going to host this stuff, and you, we're going to be vital to the stakeholders to help move this along. We can't keep getting the short end of the stick in the rural communities. And I'm going to bring that up in committee hearings that's, uh, that's going to show an example of that, that tomorrow night. My phone's been ringing all day, and it holds to we've, we've got to change some other things we're doing, and, and, and I can get into detail with other people that will help you along this and show you how we've got where we've gotten, and it's why these communities are putting 300-foot setbacks in, uh, in restricting it completely, almost zoning out the ability to have the green energy out here. So that's for a conversation later on, but without them at the table benefiting from it, because we're subsidizing it as taxpayers, now we're hosting it, and we're being taken advantage of. Uh, and I'll have that discuss- discussion with somebody offline anytime, uh, and I would love to have that. So I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, we all have to be part of the solution, and we can't be abused in one side versus the other. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, Eric, can, I, uh, sorry, can, I, can I respond to that? Go ahead, Director. <laughs> sorry, thank you. Really quickly, Senator, that's a really good point, and I think there is a you know there's a balance that needs to be <clears throat> met between uh, urban and rural. And I think you know one of the things that, that we've seen is, frankly, if we can drive more of that into the urban settings, on rooftops, you know, residential, and provide more financing that provides you know that incentive, not just incentives. But financing as well, and a lot of what we've talked about tonight is is efficiency. And you'll hear a lot more about efficiency, but how we can provide more incentive to get more renewables done in the urban centers, uh, you know, I think that's going to be a key part to, to hitting that balance. Go ahead, Senator Rogers. As a follow up, I'll use a perfect example because I'm familiar with the zoning in, in the town that I reside in. They've. Uh, got such a bad taste in their mouth on this being pushed and, and we, us taking advantage, advantage, the pendulum has swung where what we consider in zoning in this town is uh, it's pretty easy to do a minor solar array. But once you get into what's considered a major solar array, the check boxes that have to be checked and done are exceedingly difficult. So in the town that I live in, because of what's happened, what they consider small, which is easy to get through, is 750 square foot. Anything over 750 square foot of solar array puts you in a category that the homeowner, in the difficulty of trying to do that, is tremendous. And the reason they've done that is because of the abuse that we've had to be put through on, I'll give you an example. Uh, cities and towns used to negotiate a tax treaty with some solar arrays. Uh several years ago and i guess somebody wasn't making enough money and there was plenty of money to go around because of the subsidies that we're paying uh that was changed to cap the amount that the cities and towns by a kilowatt 
So that greatly reduced the amount of money of revenue that we could go. And it was a one-size-fits-all, whether it was an AR zone or was it a commercial industrial zone. So then they kind of shifted and they started changing the zoning underneath the solar arrays to commercial and residential. Now we have built, which, which didn't get them back to where they were as whole for hosting these solar arrays, but it put them a little bit back to center. And lo and behold, now we have bills that are going to sever that ability and say, oh, it's AR and you can't change the zoning, which and retroactively, which will and sometimes reduce current revenue by a half a million dollars. So, again, if we're going to be state players, we need, I need to sit down and talk to somebody and say, listen, if we're going to be state players, we can't keep, for the sake of argument, destroying the ability of the municipalities to at least make it compatible for them to argue that, hey, we are, we are hosting it, but here's the benefit that we're getting that may kind of soften that, that edge. And that's not happening. And it's turning around into, all right, if we're not getting a benefit and, and, and they're attacking us everywhere we are, we're just going to make it so difficult to zone, restrictive, and then it turns into court battles. So we need to have a discussion uh, and we've been past the point where the zoning has been restricted because of that, but nobody's addressing that. And I'd love to have that conversation because these r rural areas have to be part of the solution for you guys to move forward and meet your goals. And it is not going to happen because of what's happened in the last 10 years. Because somebody's making money, but it ain't the municipalities to offset to say, you know what, we can be part of the solution and benefit like you and everybody else. And that, that discussion... That train left quite a while ago, and that seems to be being ignored. And I'd ha love to have that conversation with other stake players, uh, stakeholders in the future. So, thanks. Thank you, Senator Rogers. Senator Archimote. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And my question is directed to whoever can answer it, and, and it uh, goes back to the, the uh, PACE program. I helped. Uh, with that legislation, Senator Conley, I think Senator uh, Chairwoman uh, Gold, strike that, uh, Director Gold was in the energy position then, I think. Uh, uh, and I recall we were just starting to get it off the ground. There were a few hiccups, but uh, there was a focus on, on getting that available to every commercial venue that we could. And then there was going to be a residential component that was ancillary to that that was going to get up and running. And I just pulled up on Google quick before I... I want to ask the question, and uh, I don't see anything that can help me to discern where we are currently with it. Can can someone give me an update on on how that program's going? It should be about four years old now, and uh, is it working? And have we gotten the residential component up to speed yet? Thank you. Yeah, Terry, I, I can address that since we have the responsibility for those programs. Um, yeah, we were handed those, uh, you know, the Infrastructure Bank was renamed back in 2015. We were given the responsibility for establishing the commercial PACE and the residential PACE programs. Uh, we moved quite quickly on the commercial PACE. Uh, we still do not have, part of the legislation was having uh, uh, the municipalities actively opt in. Uh, we're, I think, I think we're at 21 municipalities now that have opted into the program. Uh, but we've invested, uh, uh, you know, we haven't invested. We've marshaled uh, private sector investors. We were not given any money to make those investments, but we have a uh, cohort of uh, uh, lenders that will lend to those projects. And, uh, uh, you know, we've done a, a, about $60 million worth of uh, clean energy projects in the commercial pace. Uh, in fact, last year, because of a couple of large transactions and some new uh, construction, uh, I think we were among the largest programs in dollar volume in the country. Uh, and we're somewhere in the top <clears throat> 10 in terms of, of that program. Uh, so that program has been quite successful. We've done everything from, you know, we just uh, uh, had an event uh, with a, a church in North Kingstown that did uh, ground mounted solar. Uh, and uh, it's going to help that uh, uh, church quite a bit in terms of its conversion and, and saving money. Uh, and everywhere from, as I said, small projects to very large projects. On the residential side, uh, we did a lot of work on that. Uh, because Rhode Island's a small place, uh, we felt that 
uh, really to make it economic for a, a capital provider. Again, we were not given any money to set up a program. Uh, but uh, to set up a program, we had to invite somebody to have effectively a monopoly position. And we were very concerned, one, about whether there was sufficient market to uh, meet the demand of, of one of these lenders. But we were also concerned about some of their practices. Uh, and in these practices and the pace, it's, it's all about quick to underwrite. Uh, and last year, L.A. County, which was, had one of the biggest residential paces programs in the country, shut it down because of consumer protection concerns. In fact, the state of California, where PACE has been, was really started and residential PACE um, uh, had to institute uh, uh, significant consumer protection laws around residential PACE uh, because some of the practices. Now, it wasn't pervasive, but it was enough that uh, concerned. So I think in some ways we kind of dodged a bullet there. Uh, we do think that there is a, we do continue to think that there's a, a financing gap uh, in some areas, especially disadvantaged communities and residential. Uh, we really don't think there is a significant gap that would require residential pace. But again, if we had the funding to set up a program, we'd set up a, a, a pilot program to see if we could make it work. But if the but we made the decision that uh, uh, commercial pace was a higher priority. Uh, the municipal clean energy was a higher priority uh, because people putting solar on the roof could get the financing. Uh, but in some areas, we do feel there's a financing gap that probably isn't best served by pace. So uh, we continue to, to, to monitor the market to see whether or not residential pace is uh, the right product for Rhode Island. Senator Archibald, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. That was a very detailed answer. Thank you. And then, so, and this is your esoteric area. I'm, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a finance guy, but I've been around budgets long enough to know enough to get me in trouble. So, uh, when it comes to non-recourse lending and fixed rates, and and you're trying to model it on something that's got enough of an incentive to get uh, residential users to embrace it, yet you don't want to create this monopoly where people can be hurt by consumers. Has there, and you said it came to a standstill, has there been any any thought process on on linking up some type of tax credits or subsidies or some other measure of legislation that we could use to, to help to get that off the ground? Because from, from people who don't qualify for subsidies and could get tax credits to those who, who would, on the lower income end may get some type of subsidy and or tax credit, God knows there's, a, there's certainly a need to... And for anybody who doesn't know, wasn't here when this stuff was passed, it's a, it's a program that enables you to get financing to put these solar projects up, not have to pay anything on it right away, have it on the end of your note. It's, it's really, it's a wonderful thing. It was really well thought out. I forget who, who was behind the thought process, but it's a, it's a wonderful thing, and it'd be great to have that available for the residential market. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. So, um, yeah, on the commercial side, yeah, there's there continues to be tax credits for, you know, the solar, and we've actually, uh, you know, for the church in question, we actually arranged for those tax credits to be sold to an investor. So the church was able to, even though they're a nonprofit, and we've done, uh, was able to take advantage of that. Um, you know, again, really, yes, the PACE program does provide 100% financing. Um, you know, part of the challenge that we have is you know these these do require liens on the property. That's how it's that's how these uh, paced loans are paid off. It's like a sewer bill. It's like a tax bill. Uh, the municipality has to register that. And the commercial side, because we don't have so many transactions, we've actually taken on the administrative burden of all the billing and collecting from the municipality. Because again, from a systems perspective, many of the municipalities aren't set up to do it. And that was another constraint that we found in residential pace is that getting the communities, one, to opt into the program, and then two, agree to do the administrative burden of the billing and collecting on behalf of whoever's lending the money was a bit challenging. Um, <clears throat> whether it's pace or some other type of financing program, uh, you know, any tax incentives or other incentives that may come from, you know, the, the incentive programs that Commissioner Uchi talked about earlier, those would still retain with the program. So again, we'd like to figure out a way that, that uh, you know, where do we really see 
the financing gaps that, that uh, are preventing people from doing clean energy uh, investments, whether it's solar on the roof or on the property, or more importantly, some of the deeper uh, clean energy retrofits of replacing your HVAC system, or in the case of uh, you know heating transformation to the electric. How can we provide financing that, that incentivizes that? One of the ways that we run all of our programs is we have capital that's continue, contributed to our program that is effectively zero cost. And then we go out and leverage it in the bond market with highly rated bonds, and we're able to pass on the savings to our borrowers, whether it's sewer enterprises, drinking water companies, uh, the cities for you know, road repaving or clean energy projects. And we think that we can design something, you know, we're part of a consortium of other green banks around the country. So we have a lot of examples of how we can deliver finance cost-effective finance into these projects to incentivize more getting done, uh, even without the, the, the PACE loan. And so uh, really complementing what's out there in the private sector, but again, addressing some of those issues, like as you said, like the 100% financing, uh, you know, secur secured by properties rather than, uh, 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 you know, overall uh, credit. Uh, so we do think we can design something uh, and still keep consumer protections in place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Archambault, did you have any follow-ups? Senator Rogers has, okay. Senator Rogers, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, we're talking about the residential and I thought, I, I heard what I thought was probably a good solution today on, on what direction I think we're going to be moving with some of this, uh, they are now proposing almost like a co-op system where you, you do have some places that they don't have the money to fix the roof up. So it kind of enables them, if they're going to be needing the roof soon, to be cost prohibitive to put the solar up. They may not have a big backyard in some of the urban areas and in inner cities where they can put a ground mount. Uh, but they're starting these programs where when they're going to put, again, in the rural areas, somewhat of a larger solar array in. And the way they're trying to start to, to fund them they're starting to do it in a co-op system where, where you may live in Central Falls or you may live in Providence and you still will have the ability to co-op and buy into that solar array where you either borrow through the infrastructure bank or some manner, fund that, and you get credits off your electric bill, but it's through the solar in this large area that was put in where they would have multiple buy-ins on residentials that would, would buy into that and co-op it and get the credit for it. And then it would be installed in the rural areas again that's going to push the stakeholders in the rural area and the municipalities and i think that's going to take off that idea where we are going to be supporting these systems in our communities which again i hate to be the dead horse we've got to get the rural communities to at least see some type of benefit if they're going to buy in on this so i think that's very important especially with this new idea with co-ops coming in to help the residential entities to buy in into the larger arrays in a co-op type situation. Thank you, Senator Rogers. And are there any other questions or comments uh, from committee members before we move to the um, next portion of our discussion? All right, I don't see any. Uh, thank you so much to our presenters. Our, our, our next presenter, um, is going to be Chris Porter with National Grid. It's going to be discussing the Rhode Island Energy Efficiency Program, giving us an overview and update from their perspective. Um, and uh, Christopher, I really appreciate your patience and thank you so much for joining us tonight. And if you want to go ahead with your presentation. Of course. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I trust everyone can hear me. Yes, we can. And now everyone can see my, my presentation as well. Yes, it's coming through, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity this evening. Uh, my name is Chris Porter uh, and I'm here representing National Grid. As, as the committee knows, National Grid is Rhode Island's largest energy distribution company. And in this role, the company also serves as the program administrator responsible for the design, delivery, and administration of the energy, energy efficiency programs made available to all of our customers. And as our as National Grid's Director of Customer Energy Management, 
I lead the team responsible for our energy efficiency program strategy, policy, and planning efforts in, in Rhode Island. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here this evening to share some information with the committee about the nature of our programs and the results that we've driven. Uh, more fundamentally, though, uh, as a company, we're also grateful to the legislature for its longstanding support for energy efficiency. Our, our programs truly do represent the least cost option to meeting the energy needs of all Rhode Islanders. Uh, and the nationally recognized that results that we, in, in close collaboration with our industry partners and with our public sector stakeholders, have been able to deliver, you know, would not be possible without the leadership demonstrated by, by this body. Moving to my first slide, uh, at its core, this is what we do. Uh, as a result of our programs and of the efforts of our industry partners, including Rise Engineering, who I think will be, will be following me this evening, uh, our, our customers consume less energy. We believe that since 2004, the cumulative effect of our programs has been to reduce Rhode Island's annual electricity consumption by nearly 20% from what it would otherwise be. This results in bill savings for participating customers, of course, um, but also reduces our overall costs of building and maintaining the infrastructure necessary to safely and reliable, reliably deliver energy to all Rhode Islanders. These savings also produce environmental benefits, including reduced greenhouse gas emissions, as the kilowatt hour that a customer doesn't buy is not only the cheapest kilowatt hour, but also the one with the fewest emissions. Moving to my next slide, um, we help these customer, or we help customers to achieve these energy savings, these reductions, through the design and delivery of a comprehensive suite of programs and services for our market rate residential our income eligible residential uh, and commercial and industrial electric and natural gas customers. These services are built first around educating and engaging customers around the opportunities and benefits that energy efficiency can provide, working jointly to identify energy savings opportunities, and then providing the technical services and financial support necessary to make the energy efficient choice as easy as possible for customers. Our program investment funding comes from three sources. Uh, primarily through utility bill-based collections from customers, uh, but also from ISO New England capacity market revenues, and as Commissioner Ucci alluded to, uh, from Reggie funding uh, as well. And our data show that since 2012, roughly 60% of Rhode Island electric customers and nearly one-third of gas customers have participated in our energy efficiency programs in some form. And independent studies directly attribute over 800 full-time equivalent jobs in Rhode Island to our programs, as well as indirect support for over 16,000 jobs. And then finally, on, on, on my last slide, and then I'm happy to open it up to questions, uh, you know, taking a broader look uh, at the benefits that the state's energy efficiency programs have created for Rhode Island, I'd like to highlight just a few additional outcomes. Um, at the beginning of my, of my statement, I shared the cumulative energy savings that we've achieved um, another way to think about these savings is that each year our programs have resulted in a 2 to 3% reduction in annual electric consumption um, and between just below to just over 1% reduction in natural gas consumption. Uh, the total impact uh, of these efforts has been over $2.2 .2 billion uh, in cumulative benefits accruing to Rhode Island between 2016 and 2020. Moreover, uh, over their lifetime, the energy efficiency measures that our customers have, have implemented since 2016 will result in the avoidance of over 7.6 million metric tons of CO2 emissions, or the equivalent of removing, excuse me, um, over 1.6 million internal combustion engine vehicles or cars from the road uh, for a year. Um, and I really think that that highlights a core role for energy efficiency moving forward. By reducing demands on our energy system, EE can not only play a direct role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but will also position the state to meet our more holistic climate goals through reducing the investments that will be required and the cost that will ultimately be borne by customers in transitioning to a lower carbon electric system and heating sector. So thank you again um, for, for your time and the opportunity to say a few words uh, about our programs and the impact that they have. Um, and again, I'd be more than happy to, to take any questions. 
Thank you so much. Um, I, I actually do have a couple questions. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. And again, as I said, thank you for joining us. Um, I, you know, one of the things, the energy efficiency programs to me are one of the most important things that we do. Um, I think it's a win-win. It has the environmental impacts. It also has the consumer impacts so where it's saving, directly saving folks money on their energy bills. And I think that that's just such an important aspect to couple those energy savings, both from an environmental perspective and, and for the consumers. Um, one of the questions I had is about how the program is currently struc structured and, and also implemented, specifically as it relates to uh, low income rate payers, uh, renters, how, how these energy efficiency programs are um, you know, kind of implemented. I know for, for renters in particular, you know, there might be a challenge in accessing some of the programs due to, you know, maybe not having a landlord who would be willing to invest um, in, in the, uh, you know, into the, the uh, changes that would be needed um, or to sign off an approval of, of those um, of those program benefits to to a renter for you know if the landlord doesn't live on the property um, they may not be interested in participating so I'm wondering if if the program as it's structured now gives uh, does any sort of uh, assessment of those um, you know how the program is executed and also if you would have any suggestions or thoughts about how we could help model a program that would specifically help some low income ratepayers in particular renters. Absolutely. Thank you for, for the question. Um, let me start with our income eligible um, programs um, where we have um, essentially dedicated programs and delivery channels um, that uh, engage um, the local cap agencies um, in delivering, you know, essentially uh, our, our suite of residential energy efficiency services to qualified, to income qualified customers. Um, but typically at uh, no incremental cost to the customer um, in contrast with our market rate programs where typically uh, the upfront cost of the energy efficiency, efficiency investment is shared between uh, incentives provided by the company and then direct costs uh, borne by, uh, by, the, by, by, the, by the participant. Um, you know, the, the question uh, about uh, serving renters is, is a challenging one, and it's not unique um, to Rhode Island or, or, or to the region. The, uh, you know, the, the, the term that's widely used to describe this challenge is called the split incentive problem. Um, and, and the challenge typically is that, as you alluded to, the, um, the owner of the building um, doesn't typically... Uh, or, or oftentimes um, pay, pay the, the electric or the gas bill, and as a result, um, doesn't directly realize um, the benefits uh, of, of energy efficiency um, in, in, in investments. Um, and so, you know, as a, as, a, as a program administrator and in conjunction with stakeholders and, and, and with our implementation partners, um, you know, we have undertaken and are continuing to undertake um, a number of efforts um, designed to promote the programs um, and the benefits in terms of um, tenant comfort, um, reduced operating um, expense associated with the building, associated with um, uh, promoting the benefits of, uh, of energy efficiency to landlords um, and promoting both awareness of and engagement um, around the uh, around the around the the programs um the other effort that i can point to i think um you know foundationally one of our core principles um in all of our energy efficiency programs is to uh is to make data-driven um decisions and really to inform um our investment decisions um based on the, the best and most recent available data available and, and, and to that end um, we are currently undertaking um, a study in Rhode Island, um, it's referred to as a non-participant study, where um, we are going out and identifying exactly those segments of customers um, that haven't yet participated in the programs to the extent um, that we would like them to, really trying to drive a deep understanding of 
what the obstacles are. Uh, and then that will put us in a position to design and implement remediation strategies um, that will allow us to overcome um, those barriers, you know, in whatever form they've manifested themselves in the delivery of our program. Thank you. And it looks like Senator Miller has a question. So as you may or may not be aware of, I have a long history around this issue. Um, going back to um, uh, proposing and helping design between National Grid and George Wiley Center and other mm -hmm. advocates at uh, PUC around how to um, actually navigate this very difficult issue in that um, tenants are sometimes subjected, especially low-income tenants, to some of the least efficient um, energy households in the state where their windows aren't insulated, the heating systems are decades old, and all the incentives are to the homeowner. Um, and the homeowner has no incentive to do any improvement because the tenant is often paying the energy costs. And so sometimes there's, you know, old fashioned electric heat. Um, like I said, uh, you know, uninsulated houses. It's just, it's really, a, a very frustrating issue to legislate and it's a very frustrating issue whether it be all the people we've heard from including you on how to get um the incentive or or the actual penalty for not investing especially in current um low income you know triple deckers are the most often used examples where there's no investment that would in, that would create savings for the low income tenant because they have no leverage to their landlord to use and and so some of the highest energy costs are to the people who can least afford it and how to redesign these programs so so it has the impact that is seriously needed it's like the remaining sector that has not been uh, appropriately tackled. Yes, no, thank, thank you for the comment. I, I wasn't personally aware of your, your, your history and your background in this issue, but um, very much appreciate your work there and, 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 and the comments. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, as you, as you alluded to, I think that, um, you know, there are carrot and stick based approaches, right? And, and energy efficiency programs, um, Really have um, have been predicated on on carrot based uh, approaches where you know through a combination of providing technical assistance, financial support, and support, and just sort of navigating the process in order to make it easy for customers. Um, that that has been um, very successful in driving customers to take action um, in many segments. It's it's harder in in a situation where those benefits um, don't directly accrue in the form of bill savings if the building owner isn't paying the bill. Um, you know, we do think that there are other sort of benefit streams um, associated with um, making those investments um, that potentially uh, would be beneficial to, to, to the building owner. Um, and so, you know, we are continuing to evaluate our efforts on that front and understand how we can use those as a motivator um, to take those actions. Um, you know, I think the other uh, approach um, potentially, um, you know, wouldn't necessarily fall inside of a, uh, you know, incentive sort of based or driven energy efficiency program, but could be achieved through codes and standards. Um, and um, that, you know, there are potentially opportunities there through um, mandating more stringent building codes um, and the enforcement of those codes um, as another tool to drive um, adoption of uh, energy efficient measures and all of the attendant benefits that accrue to society and to the tenants of those buildings through uh, codes-based approaches. Yeah, I think this, there's a couple of sectors where this really has not had the impact needed um, you take like all the solar projects we've had. I don't think one of them has enough incentive into into it so that a landlord would put a solar array on a um, like a triple decker home 
where they're not paying any of the energy costs. So why would they? And so it's, I think it's a really important issue to try to figure out uh, some kind of impact or penetration into that dilemma. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing happens on commercials sometimes is where the, all the commercial tenants are, um, um, you, you know, would benefit and the landlord has no incentive because the commercial tenant is, is um, paying all the utilities. So they have no, there's no incentive. And um, it's, uh, I think it's worth trying to come up with some ideas on how to incentivize this. Uh, absolutely. Thank you for the comment. Thank you so much. Are there any other comments or questions from committee members? Okay, I don't see anything, any. Um, thank you so much, Chris, and appreciate, appreciate your time and your testimony. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you again for the, for the opportunity. And uh, our final presenter for this evening is Vincent Graziano. He's with Rise Engineering. He's also going to be talking about the energy efficiency program uh, from Rise Engineering's perspective. And Vin, if you wanna go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, to get this to show up properly. Yep, we can see your presentation. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, and, and uh, um, uh, thanks to all for for, um, for sticking with us for the, for the last couple of hours. Really appreciate your interest and and, and obviously the support that's that's inherent in many of the comments uh, that you folks um, have offered to us. Uh, I'll just talk briefly about Arise, just a very quickly overview. Um, we've been servicing Rhode Island, Rhode Islanders since 1977. Um, for the last 25 or 26 years, we've been a division of a company called Tilsch Engineering uh, that's based here in Cranston. Um, we have grown uh, over the time to have over 300 staff um, in the RISE division providing energy efficiency services. Uh, and we're an employee-owned company. We've been employee-owned um, at 100% since uh, 2008. Um, over our history, we've arranged uh, about $1.4 billion worth of work and, and to echo some of the comments that certainly Chris made and other, the other speakers have made, it's really uh, the, that kind of achievement is really due in large part to the support um, that's truly unique in, in state public policy that we've seen from um, the General Assembly, from, from uh, the Public Utilities Commission, the Energy Office, and certainly National Grid and other stakeholders. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a direct evidence of, of a company uh, that grows and, and the economic development uh, impacts associated with it. Along those same lines, we also work with about 45 uh, other Rhode Island-based subcontractors. Uh, most of those firms generate about 75% of their annual revenue contracts uh, or activity with uh, uh, National Grid and some of the other programs, and those account for up to uh, maybe 400 more employees. So it kind of bolsters the, the numbers that Chris uh, provided to you. The service we provide um, is pretty much mirrored across sectors uh, and divided into three, three parts. The, the first is that the service includes some form of an on-site or in-home energy assessment. We identify what you can do, um, what it's going to take to, to make the improvement happen, uh, how much it, co it will cost you and how much it will save. Um, the second leg of the service is to actually help arrange for the installation of those improvements um, using qualified contractors. And, and other resources and making sure we do that uh, cost effectively. And the third element uh, of that service uh, is to try and help it, help make it affordable for the end users that we serve by facilitating and take care of the access to types of incentives or financing tax credits that uh, have been talked about uh, earlier today. So we kind of help you identify what you can do, we help you get it done, and we help make it affordable so you can pay for it. A lot of what we do is under direct contract to program sponsors like National Grid. Um, they periodically offer um, a request for proposal opportunities to, cost, to firms like us, and we respond to those um, opportunities. We're currently delivering services directly to National Grid for residential homeowners 
uh, for the multifamily buildings that we just talked about, uh, as well as the small businesses. Uh, and RISE also worked directly with end users uh, in other areas like renewables and uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Um, indoor air quality has been a, a huge uh, activity over the last couple of years. The street lights that you heard about as well as um, the commercial work. Some of the granular numbers over the last couple of years um, that might have been uh, even higher were it not for the, the shutdown last year uh, for about three or four months due to the pandemic. We've actually been in over 22,000 uh, Rhode Island homes over the last couple of years to do those energy assessments. Um, over 8,000 of them have had weatherization projects installed, accounting for about $35 million in improvements. Um, we've been in about 1,500 small businesses and completed projects for those 1,500 uh, small businesses. Uh, and over 9,000 uh, multifamily dwelling units have also been served. So, so when you, you know, kind of place these kinds of numbers in the context of what you heard from the previous speakers about the energy savings and the spending uh, and resources that have been dedicated to it, and you think about this in the context of the, um, of the employment numbers, you, you can see it's, a, it's really a key driver for um, uh, a lot of activity um, within the state. And um, it's, a, it's a source of economic development as well as, as energy and health impacts and, and um, some of the other benefits that have been talked about. Um, in the context of, of where Reggie fits into all of this, you've heard um, the common theme. Um, Reggie is a gap filler in many instances. Kind of take uh, services or incentives that are available elsewhere, like national grids that Chris talked about. Um, and Reggie provides some important resources to help plug some of those gaps or to supplement those programs. So uh, we work directly with uh, the Office of Energy Resources and National Grid that list that, uh, that Commissioner Uchi uh, displayed of maybe eight to 10 different programs. And I think RISE is, is uh, involved um, directly in four or five of those at least. And, and we also help um, our, our end users access other REGI funded resources that we may not do directly, but for example, accessing the renewable uh, resources from Commerce RI or financing uh, from the infrastructure bank that, that Jeff described. The stuff that we're doing directly, um, financing initiatives for heat pumps, for example, is something that we've just started a couple of months ago. We've got about 60 or 70 um, that have been processed already. Dear and dear to Senator Miller's heart on, on low and moderate income weatherization, um, uh, basically um, just do it for them. Go, go identify the work and, and, and get that work installed for those customers at no cost is, a, is another initiative that's ongoing. There's been work ongoing in farms. And again, Commissioner Uchi described weatherization work for small businesses. We're, we're going into um, neighborhoods kind of by zip code um, and we'll be targeting small businesses um, in communities that might have been hit a little bit harder by COVID. Um, so, um, you know, kind of get in there and do it for them is what the, what the um, what the approach is, and um, that should be getting underway in the, in the next um, few weeks. Um, some of the stuff we do indirectly with Reggie, uh, again, renewable programs, <clears throat> excuse me, municipal street lighting. Um, we've done a lot of work in state buildings, uh, electric vehicle charging stations, and again, in conjunction with the infrastructure bank. You've heard the, the, the process um, described on, on how Reggie money um, gets allocated. Um, we think that's a huge uh, benefit uh, to the resources. The fact that the, the, there's uh, the, the uh, semi-annual um, allocation of funds is subject to public comment and bid. So, so you have an opportunity to, 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 uh, to make your case if you, if you feel that um, uh, the, you know, the allocation could go in a different direction. Um, and its ability to, again, previously mentioned, leverage um, existing resources um, so that there's minimal admin cost enables um, the program to deliver most of its resources directly to the benefit of end use. And, um, and so that's a, that's a, um, a huge, um, I think, advantage uh, to how Reggie is currently operated within the state it's tie in with other resources like uh, 
the programs that Chris described for National Grid. Um, it's a real, it's, you know, we're looking for win-win packages. Uh, from a public policy standpoint, I do believe that this is a, this is really a win-win um, at all level, levels across Rhode Island. Um, taking a look going forward, just to wrap up, um, you know, certainly would encourage um, uh, the senators to, 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 to work to extend the state's energy efficiency law that's, that's currently in front of you, that proposal to extend it, I think, to 2035 or something would provide some, some real continued stability in, in what we've been doing and, and, and what's been happening here in Rhode Island um, to help us attain that national leadership role that was mentioned. And, and uh, you know, the Reggie resources that right here provide a real crucial complementary framework and, and complementary resources to help us maintain that leadership position nationally. It's nice to be associated uh, with, with something where, where Rhode Island is in the top five and it's for a good reason. It's a, it's a good thing that we're in the top five and uh, we're proud of that. We've been privileged to, do, to work um, with the folks uh, on this call and, and with the assembly and, and regulators and we look forward to um, many more years to come. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I do see that Senator Kalman has a question already. Thank you, Madam Chair. It wasn't actually a question. It was just a comment. Um, I participated in um, the weatherization program and I just wanted to say out loud for the benefit of everybody that I had a great experience. Um, it saved us a, a lot of money um, and it's made a really big difference in my very old house. So um, personally, I wanted to applaud this work. So, Senator, thank you for that. We, we, I have my fingers crossed when I make these these presentations at times uh, that someone is going to sp speak up. So I really appreciate you doing that, and and thank you. And and uh, uh, you know, it it is an experience we think that is shared by um, by most of the participants in the program. We get um, you know very very good word of mouth um, coming out of it. So thank you very much for your kind comments. Thank you. And and Vin, if I could ask you to unshare your screen, it. Um, Having the shared screen does uh, cause some issues with the live stream. So as we get into Q and A, I want to have the opportunity for everybody to be able to see um, see the Q and A. All right, thank you so much. And uh, Senator Miller had a, qu a question or a comment. Go ahead, Senator. Same comment as Senator Coleman. I use it both my bit rise has done work at both my home and uh, my business and the. Um, the results are amazing. I mean, you know, if if every Rhode Islander was listening to this and understood what, what they could access through Rise, it would be uh, a great improvement in everybody's uh, wallet and the and the environment of the state. Thank you so much, Senator. Appreciate that. Go ahead, Senator Valverde. Well, I'm just going to pile on because I also have had it done to my house and had a great experience, and I tell everyone about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Chris Porter, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, I am. I was just texting you, Vin. Thrilled to hear the positive view. I'm trying to figure out how we can leverage all this positive word of mouth from uh, from from the committee here to, to drive some more demand um, and to drive awareness among our customers. I and mean, we have a municipal program where we've leveraged um, you know municipal governments and municipal leaders to, to great effect. Uh, I'd love to explore how we can um, you know work more closely. Um, with the legislature as well to drive awareness of the benefits of these programs to your constituents. Right. And that actually touched on a question that I have is, is um, how full of capacity is the program? Do you have a, a wait list every year? Is this something um, that you, you need more um, awareness around? So that's, that's a that's a great question, and it's actually uh, it's actually very germane in, in these times, and it actually touches on I think the some of the economic development and, and uh, diversity and, and and worker training uh, kinds of issues. Um, the industry right now is is suffering from the same type of labor shortage that you're hearing about uh, from from other corners of the of the economy. Um, the the weatherization backlog that that um, uh, I mentioned the weatherization work that we have available and, and we could do. Um, right now we have about a four or five month backlog. So if we were to, to, to come to you to do the assessment, 
but there's just not enough insulation contractors out there um, for us to complete that work in a timely fashion. And they're, they're having a lot of trouble um, uh, finding folks um, who you know, are willing to, to do that kind of work. And, and so there's been a lot of emphasis within the program um, to really focus on workforce development and workforce training, particularly in the disadvantaged communities. And, you know, I, I would probably say out, outside of the core program delivery, you know, the, the getting it right and doing the calculations correctly and making sure the work is done properly, the biggest challenge facing the programs right now uh, is to, is to uh, find ways to supplement the resources within the programs to help support the infrastructure that's necessary to deliver these um, services at the scale um, that the customers are, are demanding uh, and, and um, that we're going to need to meet the challenges um, that are set forth in the, the climate legislation. It's a big issue. Thank you. That's that's really helpful. Um, when you say that you're having trouble um, kind of finding contractors, it, I'm curious if you can, if you have a sense as to, is there a specific area or skill set um, that you think there needs to um, that, that the state should be focusing on. I mean, obviously we've developed some uh, pretty aggressive climate goals, and so we're gonna be, be needing to amp up this work. And so um, I think it would be helpful if there's any trends that you're seeing that we should be made aware of as, as we continue our efforts from our perspectives. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I do think the, the, the problem is, is almost across the board within the building trades. So, so RISE um, is a licensed electrical contractor. Um, we do have about 30 or so electricians on staff. Uh, we have had uh, job postings and recruiting going on for at least six to seven years to try and supplement um, the electrical staff and, and bring more on ourselves and also find electrical contractors who are willing to serve uh, as subs to us because it, you know part of the objective of the programs is, is, is not to keep everything for eyes for itself, but rather to, again, build that infrastructure and, and work with a network of qualified subs. Electricians is a huge issue. Um, pipe fitters uh, uh, and, and, and technicians for controls are a huge issue. The specific issue that's affecting the residential program delivery right now is, again, the insulation um, uh, industry. It's a relatively low-skilled trade, um, uh, but um, the, and, and the wages have grown considerably over what they were just, you know, let's say five or six years ago, just to, to maintain and keep the, the work as they have, because what's happening is companies are pirating from other companies, as opposed to bringing new entrants into the field. You tend to steal somebody from someone else for an extra dollar or two an hour. And so um, I, I do think it's, a, it's across the board. Um, certainly the unions have some, some, some active training programs but I think they're even experiencing those same types of issues. So it's a, it is, it is a, um, it is a constraint that, um, that is, that is a big challenge for all of us right now. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful information. Um, and I'm wondering too, you talked about the 45 different companies that you work with. I just was wondering if there's a sense as those are all of those, um, or co contractors, are those all Rhode Island based? Are the, is this regional where you get your workforce from? So the, the 45 number was, was, was specifically Rhode Island subcontractor. So, you know, we, we, um, you know, rise, uh, and based in part on, on um, I guess, what we were able to accomplish here in Rhode Island, you know, we've been privileged to be able to expand services uh, into neighboring states. So we do do a lot of work in, in Massachusetts and New York and New Hampshire, um, mostly in conjunction with companies like Grid, who have uh, service territories in, in neighboring states. But that number of 45 subcontractors is a Rhode Island specific number. And, um, and the number of employees um, that I mentioned would be Rhode Island specific. Thank you so much. Are there any other comments or questions from the committee? Okay, I, I don't see any, but we do have a member of the public who will be joining us.
and we should be joined now by Hank Webster. Hank, welcome to the committee. If you want to go ahead and introduce your, yourself to the committee, um, who you're testifying for, and um, you can go ahead with your remarks. Good evening, Chair Oyer and members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify tonight regarding the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, or REGI, and Rhode Island's Energy Efficiency Programs. My name is Hank Webster, and I'm the Rhode Island Director of Acadia Center, a nonprofit research and advocacy organization working throughout the Northeast to advance the clean energy future. I've submitted two separate sets of written testimony for your review, uh, including our 10-year REGI program review that we published in 2019, so I'll keep my remarks to just a brief summary. Acadia Center strongly supports the REGI program and Rhode Island's na nation-leading energy efficiency programs. Both efforts have yielded significant benefits for Rhode Island. Since the REGI program began, carbon dioxide emissions from power plants fell by 55%, outpacing the rest of the country by approximately 90%. Meanwhile, electricity prices in Reggie states, including Rhode Island, have fallen approximately 5.7%, while electricity prices have increased in the rest of the country by 8.6%. GDP of Reggie states has also grown by approximately 50%, outpacing the growth in the rest of the country by approximately 30%. The REGI program has generated uh, $3.95 billion, with a B, in, al in allowance auction proceeds, and that number will surpass $4 billion uh, in June. And Rhode Island has received $87.7 million in those proceeds, the majority of which have been invested in energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. Similarly, the state's energy efficiency programs have provided significant benefits for Rhode Islanders. In fact, for every dollar invested, uh, in energy efficiency, Rhode Islanders see benefits of $3.80, which is a nearly 4 to 1 ratio of benefits to the cost. The energy efficiency programs have also helped create thousands of clean energy jobs, well over 10,000. And in terms of energy savings we've achieved together since 2012, we've saved the equivalent of 10 years of electricity production from the Manchester Street Power Plant in Providence. We've also saved the equivalent of the gas used by over 500,000 homes over the course of a year. And finally, we've avoided the carbon dioxide pollution equivalent to the annual emissions of over 2.1 million internal combustion engine cars. That's not to say that the programs are perfect. We know that pollution from power plants, even with the pollution reductions that REGI has achieved, disproportionately impact the communities where those facilities are often cited. And those communities are predominantly comprised of low-income households and families of color. As the REGI program approaches its third program review later this year, Acadia Center is urging a still more aggressive cap and a focus on reducing emissions in environmental justice communities around the region. And as successful as our state energy efficiency programs have been, we know that the benefits have not always reached low- and moderate-income customers due to a variety of barriers. As these programs are at an inflection point, and will need to adapt to find deeper energy savings, Acadia Center is urging Rhode Island to pursue a next-generation energy efficiency approach, one that focuses on overcoming those barriers to improve housing quality, remove environmental hazards, weatherize buildings, and electrify fossil fuel heating and appliance end uses to improve indoor air quality and reduce in carbon emissions. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide comments to this committee. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, Hank. Uh, do any of the committee members have any questions? I don't see any, but, but Hank, I do want to say that was a pretty good summary of a two and a half hour hearing. Um, so I do appreciate, uh, I do appreciate that summary. It is, it is sometimes good to be able to boil down um, into simple statistics um, after, after a lengthy hearing. So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you weighing in um, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Chair. Have a good night. Um, with that, I want to express my, my deep appreciation to all of our presenters tonight, as well as the committee members for their engagement. Um, I know that this is an a important topic for the state and for uh, all of us as we continue to strive to achieve our climate goals. And so I want to thank everybody for joining us. And if I could entertain a motion for adjournment, and that is motion by Senator Coleman, seconded by Senator DeMario. All in favor? And we are adjourned. Thank you so much.